Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rick Feldman, and I'm the president and CEO of NATP, and I wanted to welcome all of you this morning. Thank you. Could you please all put your devices on the non-bothersome mode so that they don't make noise while these guys are talking? It's distracting. So we appreciate it. Um, so we're very excited about our PitchCon. And first of all, um, we rely on the kindness of our friends and strangers. And so first of all, we want to thank CBS and CAA for supporting the coffee this morning. So let's give both of those wonderful companies a round of applause. And this session, as you know, kicks off our day and a half um, PitchCon. And good luck to many of you who are going to be doing your pitches tomorrow morning. Um, and make sure that you treat Janine right, so that she treats you right. Um, so this, se this session is, is the beginning of our day. In moderating, we have uh, Jojo Wright of KISS FM. And of course, our featured speaker is Peter Lenkov, the executive producer of Hawaii Five-O. So thank you guys for coming this morning. Um, in addition to CAA and CBS, um, we want to thank our other sponsors of the event for the day and a half, and that would be Lifetime, UTA, E, and Synchronize. So thank you to those guys as well. Thank you. So following the coffee uh, this morning, we have a full day of programming for you consisting of panels, pitch clinics, pitch critiques, master classes. So please make the most of your day, enjoy, do me a favor, do yourselves a favor, show up on time. That makes everything run on time, makes everybody feel good, and we appreciate it. So along with that, this is what I need to tell you. At 1 o'clock, we have a one-hour lunch break, okay? One-hour lunch break. Everyone's on their own to grab something. You're in the middle of Hollywood. It's going to be easy. It's relatively expensive. You can have a great time. But then at 2 o'clock sharp, we're going to start. And I, I just have to tell you that at 2 o'clock, the people that are coming at 2 o'clock expect to start at 2 o'clock. And there are visitors, and there are guests, and there are important people like all of you are. And so if we can fill the room at 2 o'clock and not at 2.20, that's really appreciated. Because it makes us all look bad if we're not here when they're here. And one last thing. This evening from 6 to 8, we have a cocktail networking party out at the pool. This is a no-host event, and we encourage you to come and enjoy yourself with fellow attendees. As well this evening, though, we have something called a digital meetup, which will start about an hour after our session starts. And that will take place in the academy room about 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, 8.30. Now, this event, is you're required to sign up in advance. So if you haven't already signed up, you need to go online and register today. I don't know how you do that, but ask Evie, and she'll tell you how. Um, so thank you for your support of NATB. Thank you for your support of this event. We hope you have a wonderful time and that we get to see many of you um, in Miami in January. So, um, Jojo? Yes, yes. The ball is yours. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good day. <laughs> we're, just discussing, uh, we're just discussing how close the uh, mic is to the stage. So uh, uh, maybe we should put it right here, Peter, right in the front. Uh, if you guys, it's sort of an informal session. If you have a little question or whatever, feel free to jump to the mic, and I'll just cut to you from time to time. No real uh, structure to it. Just have fun, relax. So yeah, just grab the mic, and, and we'll, we'll toss to you. Before I uh, begin this conversation with Peter, let's roll a video. This is some excerpts from his show, Hawaii Five O. So press play on the clip, please. I was hoping they were wrong about you. I didn't kill Laura Hills. You did. You move, I will put a bullet in you. Put your hand on the desk. Just put the gun away and we can talk. It goes down when we're done. What do you want? I want a confession. You have a gun pointed at my head. I'll say whatever you want, Steve. I want the truth. I don't know what you're talking about. I know what you did. I know everything. Then why don't you just go up ahead and pull the trigger? Because the one answers. Speak. Trust me, that is not what you want. Don't touch that phone. Don't answer it. Look at me. I know my father was investigating you. I know about your ties to the Yakuza. I know about the Noshimori brothers. 
I don't bet your connection to Wolf Fat. My father was getting close to exposing you, wasn't he, Governor? Huh? That's why my mother died in that car bomb? Just like Laura Hills. Well, what I really want to know is who gave the order? I know Koji Noshimori said the car bomb and killed my mother. I know Victor has killed my father. But I want to know who gave the order, Governor? Was it Wolf Fat? Or was it you? I was gonna say that's less of a sort of you know series of clips. It's a it's a scene from I don't know if anybody saw the episode. It was our finale this year, but it's actually an interesting clip that they chose because that idea of making the governor bad really was something when uh, we started and we pitched this idea to CBS. That idea was there from the beginning, and um, so being allowed to sort of follow that arc and seeing it through was very satisfying for writers. So. It's an interesting scene because uh, I think for uh, also for the most part we uh, we kept it a secret from most people and even when we wrote the scene we uh, didn't show it to any of the actors and we never told Jean Smart from the beginning that uh, she was going to be bad. She only found out that she was behind this whole sort of conspiracy uh, two days before we were shooting. So um, I think it, for us it was a successful moment because uh, nobody saw it coming. Was the reason for that just you didn't want it to leak online, stuff like that, the storyline to leak out to? Yeah, I think, you know, for, for people that really follow the, the show religiously, I think, um, I think they look for that kind of stuff, like those little tidbits, and then we just didn't want anything coming out. I, I think it felt like a very sort of shocking end to the season, and uh, because those two had such a close relationship that uh, having her sort of be, you know, uh, sort of behind this whole thing. I, we felt that, uh, you know, don't hint at it at all, and it'll be a great surprise. And I think for the most part, we were successful at that, so. We were talking uh, backstage about, uh, you know, we're getting to the, the nuts and bolts of pitching the show and, you know, how, how you got it on the air, you know, soon here, but uh, I never thought of this, him having to deal with this. Uh, he, the, the, I guess the fans in Hawaii have just embraced this show so much. They, they like you said, they're, they're very passionate and they're very protective and they love this show, and uh, he has, well, just give, give me the story about the, that there's a, a guy who does a radio show, and he dissects everything you do, so if this would have leaked out, he would have been all over it, obviously. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, it, it's funny, there's, we were talking earlier, there's, uh, there's a lot of fan sites for the show, but there was uh, one gentleman in particular that uh, started a site, and, and uh, it's called 5.0 Undercover, and he's been following the show from the beginning, and... Um, Really, everything 5.0 is on that site, and uh, he he ends up he ends up he sort of becomes a sort of like local celebrity because every Tuesday, the night after the show airs, there's a radio show, an AM radio talk show in, in Hawaii called the Mike Buck Show, and they spend the time I think it's 40 something minutes dissecting the episode the night before, and this guy, this expert, this 5.0 undercover, he's sort of uh, Webmaster calls up and uh, he's sort of like the local expert on everything 5.0 and they dissect our show and they're and there's call you know people call in and talk about their favorite moments their you know things they didn't like and uh, it sort of got this whole life of its own because you know they're again like you said they're the people people in Oahu and all the other islands they're they're very protective of the show they identify themselves with this show and. Um, they have these, you know, Monday night get-togethers where places will close down and everybody's watching 5 -0. So uh, it's unlike any other experience I've ever had on a TV show. Yeah, I, thought, I thought when he told me the story, this guy was some sort of nut, you know? He's a dentist. This guy's a dentist. It's just, uh, he, yeah, you've got a good fan with that guy. So you reward him occasionally with some exclusives, like you said, and interviews and all that, obviously. Yeah, and, and uh, we'll go on the show every now and then. Actually, uh, closer to the end of the season, we started... Uh, um, doing some little uh, interviews with the radio show and ending, we ended up talking to him as well, the, uh, the gentleman who created the site. Another funny point, uh, there was a, an issue you had on the show to, to, uh, to use the phrase slippers versus flip-flops, and it seems like no big deal, but this turned out to be quite the, uh, the hairdo for you for a quick minute. Uh, can you explain what happened with that uh, uh, decision the you had to make? Slipper gate, yeah. 
Well, it just, you know, uh, you know, there, there is a, um, um, there's a, you, you sort of want to, you want to uh, honor the island and honor the people and, and stay true to that, that culture and, and, uh, and uh, is, with the Chin Ho character, he was a local and uh, the idea was he, was, he talks pigeon and, and, uh, um, and it just, it, there was a scene, it was sort of like this, you know, real small little moment where he tells Danny to wear uh, flip-flops. And flip-flops in Hawaii are, they call them slippers. But I remember Daniel Day Kim called me up and said, don't, allow, don't let me say this. I, I, I don't want to say uh, flip-flops because everybody's going to kill me here. Um, but I felt I, I really had to make a decision and on, on what, and again, it's so small, it seems so trivial, but I wanted to use flip-flops because I had to really co concern myself with everybody else's interpretation, not the 800,000 people that are living on the island, but I had to worry about sort of like the bigger scale of the show, uh, meaning the rest of you know, the United States and ultimately um, the other countries that buy the show and how it's sort of interpreted. Slippers, most people think, if you even look on Wikipedia, they're considered you know, bedtime footwear. So, it would seem odd for Chin Ho to tell Danny, hey, you're outside on the beach, wear slippers. So, <laughs> so I had him say flip-flops. The actor didn't like it. it, it literally, uh, Twitter and Facebook and all these sites blew up the next day and people were really angry with me and, and uh, that was early in the season, luckily, so. Um, but, you know, they, they dissect, the people that I dissect every moment of that show. One of the stranger things you do as an executive producer, obviously. Um, well, let's, let's step back to, uh, I guess, what everybody wants to know, because uh, we all want to be in your shoes to some degree. You know, uh, everybody's different, but you have a... You've well, careful what you wish for. No, no doubt, right? <laughs> you, you pitched this show. You went to CBS. You said, hey, I want to do this show. And, of course, right now, in hindsight, it's a no-brainer. But, you know, I'm sure at that time, you had some people saying, hey, Peter, do it. Hey, Peter, don't do it. You know, what were the hurdles you had to overcome to sell CBS to do a... Uh, a remake. Well, it, it wasn't my idea to do the remake. Actually, it was CBS's idea, and, and they had developed it. I think there was a couple development cycles where they had developed uh, uh, scripts with other writers. And um, but I, it, it sort of came to me through my agent uh, at CAA, uh, who happens to be here. I'm not going to point him out. I don't want to embarrass him. But he he sort of brought up the idea. Um, would you be interested in Five O? And and you know, my the the my guttural response was yes, because I had a, a very close connection to that show because I remember as a little kid, and again, I have vague memories of this, but I remember sitting by his knee while he watched the show, and that was a big show to him. He loved that show. Um, in fact, he was driving the same Mercury. Um, he would buy a, Mer he's actually just, we got, just got rid of his Mercury about six months ago. And I think part of him driving that Mercury was going back to the, you know, the Jack Lord character. But uh, I remember how important the show was to him, and it was sort of family viewing in our house. Um, so my guttural reaction was, yes, I want to do it because I, I, I know the material, I'm, I'm passionate about it, and I'd, I'd love to, um, to, uh, to tackle this. But you know, sort of like the common sense part of you says, don't do it. And then you start having friends in the business tell you, don't do it because these things fail. For the most part, anytime you remake something or reboot something, it already has a sort of, you know, sort of, you know, this sort of bag of negatives attached to it, and uh, you shouldn't do it. But I felt, and I learned this, you know, you know, a, a while ago. It's like you only want to, you, you don't want to take a job for the job. You want to take a job because you're passionate about it. and You truly believe you could do a good job. So that's the reason I wanted to do it. I, because I, I truly felt that even if I failed, I would have given it everything, and I would have taken the job for the right reasons. Um, it's one of those jobs that you do for free because you really are passionate about it. Um, and I ended up, um, you know, again, this started with, do you want to do this? And I said yes, and I sort of came up with a take. And then, again, my, my agent um, partnered me up with, with Kurtzman and Orsi, and uh, I was a huge fan of theirs. And so that was for sort of my first audition was getting these guys uh, excited about the project. I knew that I would have a really good chance of, of getting this, you know, um, sold at CBS. My, my take on it, getting sold at CBS, because I wanted to do a premise pilot, like an origin story. And most networks don't like to do origin stories. They like to sort of have pilots that you 
the sort of like franchise is, is already set and um, uh, so what you're watching, the, you know, the, the, the first episode is really an episode that could air any point in the series. Uh, so you know what you're getting right from the beginning. Like you know what every episode is going to be like. It's already branded. Like you sit and watch the show, you know that you're going to get this kind of you know, construct every week. Um, but for me, I felt the, va what I, the value that I could add to this was, and again, it goes back to what I remember from the show, I remember the, the beautiful scenery, I remember these very sort of, you know, this, these stoic characters, but I don't remember any, I didn't know who they were, no character development, and I felt you know, that's, the, that's the value that I could add, is, is make these people three-dimensional. So I felt that in order to do that, I'd like to see where they come from, what makes this FIBO task force, and why they're so good at their jobs. So once Kirsten and Orsi got involved with their, you know, I mean, you know, they're super writers, so, so and, and just producers, and, and um, just the fact that Star Trek was so successful, and that was an origin story, I just felt like, okay, there's no way they're gonna pass. CBS. So we ended up going to the studio and we, we sort of honed it, you know, what I had done. We honed it and we went in and, you know, we did a presentation and, and uh, I, I had done a lot of, you know, a lot of work on, on, um, on what I was going to present to them. Unlike you would normally do, I actually brought in sort of pictures of who I saw as the cast and, you know, these were like not realistic ideas, but for me, like Bruce Willis was the Dano character, somebody who is from the East Coast, he's, you know, he's here for, you know, it's, it's, and again, it's Bruce Willis die hard in, in uh, Hawaii. So I brought all these sort of photos of who I saw the cast as um, and really sort of had a rich backstory and um, things like, you know, the governor, you know, becoming, you know, keep your friends close, your enemies closer. is like the governor starts his task force because she wants to keep her sort of eyes and, and, and ears locked on what McGarrett's doing, so he doesn't investigate the father's murder, and if he starts investigating it, she will know first. So, you know, all these things that you really normally don't take your time developing, because usually you're just sort of crafting what the concept is, and then if you sell it, you're going, oh my God, what do I do now? I gotta start thinking about the series. <laughs> so, I really put all that time and effort into it, and I think just the, you know, having, you know, Chris Minorsi, gave it sort of like this good housekeeping seal of approval and they knew it would be a certain quality quality show and uh, and we um, we ended up selling it to this, the uh, network and really it was probably the easiest development I, I've ever had because I think again it goes back to really being passionate and prepared for it um, and um, so it was kind of it was kind of pretty smooth I assume you did not approach or did you approach Bruce Willis or some of the other characters uh, for the actual roles? No, no. For me, that was just, you know, CB, to get CBS excited about these archetypes. You know, it's like the idea was that th you know these characters, imagine them in this kind of situation. Um, so I knew we weren't going to get, you know, I mean, I, I, I'd be embarrassed to tell you the people that I had on uh, photos I brought in, but it was more about getting them excited on what it could be. Um, and, um, and, and I guess it worked, so. Yeah, it's definitely doing, uh, doing well. And uh, I guess my, um, he also mentioned earlier that he used to sit and watch this show with his dad, uh, the original Hawaii Five-O. Hawaii Five and as a kid, you told me the, the Dano character. And this is, you know, this is young Peter Lenkov looking at the TV going, that Dano dude doesn't look like he belongs on the island. So you've made some adjustments to make this character, this Dano, look like he you know, fits more so. What did you mean by that? And what adjustments did you specifically make to make sure this character fit, in your opinion? I, I, again, going back to those vague memories, I just remember when I was watching that show, I, he just looked like he was a fish out of He just looked like he didn't belong there. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. And um, I think even, I'm, I'm trying to remember back, for some reason I keep remembering the show in black and white. I kept remembering the show in black and white, I don't know why. But, um, but I still remember him being fair-haired, and he just looked different than everybody else. And I just thought, like, what's he doing uh, sort of on the island and, you know, working with, with this group of guys? And so I just felt like I took that sort of uh, um, um, that memory and, uh, and sort of started to craft this backstory for the character. But I also felt I wanted that character to be the, the, um, the audience, somebody who... Um, is sort of a fish out of water, who's there maybe temporarily, um, who 
and also, you know, the idea is that you know most people go there thinking it's paradise and want to live there, and he doesn't want to live there. I just thought there was a lot of interesting things for that character, but it all stems from looking at him, at looking at James MacArthur back then, and just wondering why is he there, and he just doesn't look like he fits in, and then you sort of build on that. What about the? Uh, uh, well, let me just talk. Let me just jump into the uh, the main character on the show, the, the island itself, and. Uh, I'm thinking he has a pretty rough life, you know, every day waking up and on, the, on this beautiful island, you know, going to work. But I'm sure there are some, some uh, possibly some downsides to, to shooting in Hawaii. I mean, is budget an, an issue? I mean, did, did you ever consider doing this show in L.A., with the exception of exterior shots and some landmarks and things of that nature? You know, there were rumors of, of maybe shooting it uh, in L.A., but I don't think realistically you can make that show. Um, uh, here and I, I just think that uh, CBS, uh, you know, everybody involved in this knew how important the island was uh, to this, and they know it's a. It sounds cliche, but they know it's a character, and um, and they know that you know going to this, you know, going to this once a week, this little vacation. And again, that's I think why my dad was attracted to it because we grew up in Canada. It was always snowing, and you know, you get to go to Hawaii once a week. I mean, that's a, that's you know, you know, that's sort of you know your vacation, or you look forward to it. So. I think they knew that there was other people that had that experience and they could still capture that. Um, uh, but going back to your, your first sort of question where you said working in paradise, here's the thing. I, and, and I think most people say, oh, how rough it is and how great it must be. But you know, when you're going, you're, it's a job. So you're waking up at 6 o'clock in the morning, you're getting in the elevator, and you know, there's other people in the elevator with you, and they're wearing shorts. And they're all, going to the, they're all going left to the beach, and you're going right to the parking lot. And you're getting in a car, going to a set, and so you're they, coming... So they've got a pina colada in their hand, just going, yeah, Peter. And you're like, oh, hell, Yeah, because every, you think even at 6 o'clock in the morning, there are people on different, you know, they're still on their different clocks. So there's people from the East Coast, people from Asia, they're all on different clocks. So they're, for them, it's, you know, it's not that early in the morning. But they're all going to the beach, going for breakfast, going to the brunch. You're going to uh, work. You come home at night, the bar is packed with people, people are coming off the beach, there's fireworks, there's all this sort of activity, and you're beat going up in the elevator, back with people that are you know, either coming off the beach or going for dinner, and you're going to your room, and it's, it's, you really don't get to put your foot in the water. So, Well, the show's done great, and clearly you've, uh, you, you know, I guess you defied the odds in a sense where, I guess, some people thought remakes, like you said, a remake is going to tank, you know, remakes just die instantly. And sure enough, you've done well with that. So uh, uh, my final question on Hawaii Five-0, unless you guys have some more uh, questions about it, the infamous line, Bookum Dano. Uh, you know, we, I, I thought of it as a 70s, you know, 60s, 70s kind of a line. Uh, did you ever, was there any question you wanted that line in the current show? Because it was such a staple from the previous show. Did you think, man, maybe Bookum Dano won't fly? Yeah, I, absolutely. And I think uh, for me, again, for me, I felt like just to put it in the show, I, and I wanted to have some meaning, some context. So uh, I sort of, you know, built a, uh, built that up. So through the course of that first, in the episode, first episode, the pilot, you sort of earn the right to say book him Dano. And I felt like if I just throw it out there, uh, uh, I'm, it's going to feel like I'm just sort of like cherry picking. <laughs> this, you know, this franchise, and I really wanted to sort of give it a life of its own and uh, justify the reason it would come out of McGarrett's mouth, because uh, it is a little, if you think about it, I mean, it, it's a kind of dated um, uh, idea, but I, I felt like we earned the right to say it at the end of the show. Um, moving on from, well, this is, this is clearly a big hit for you. I think we can all learn something, something uh, from you in this room about some of your misses. You know, you, I mean, you've had Hawaii Five Vote, you've had, uh, you know, the 24, your CSI, you know, all this, Demolition Man, the whole nine. Uh, but uh, have, have you been in some situations? Well, of course you have. You're, you're human, I think. Um, you've you've had, a, had an idea. Yeah, this is going to be great. You go pitch it. Just wah, wah, wah. What did you learn from those if you've had uh, some of those you feel like talking about? I think, uh, yeah, no, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. Actually, you, you know, there's, a movie that has my dog's name on it, and, and uh, you sort of you know you sort of take that suit in them. But I think what you learn over the years is going back to I think what I said earlier is you want to do something because you're really passionate about it, you believe in it, you think you can uh, um, you think you could sort of 
you know, take it over the plate. I, and I think uh, for me, I, I learned that I'm only going to take jobs that I'm really, I, I believe and I'm passionate about. You're going to commit that time and everybody's sort of like, especially with the 5.0 franchise, I felt for me it was so big, you know, for, for CBS, it was, you know, on the, year, on the air for 12 years and, and um, I felt there was a lot of weight, you know, uh, on my shoulders because of that. But I also felt like, again, I was passionate about it. Um, but I also was a little naive because I didn't realize until maybe after how big the show was um, internationally. I think I wasn't really paying attention to what a brand it was. I was really just looking at it, you know, with blinders on as an experience that I had and I could bring this back. Um, I remember Nina Tassler, you know, president of CBS said, um, she said to me, you did it, uh, you know, uh, and they had tried to do this for so many years and, and I didn't realize how important it was to the CBS as a whole to sort of like, this is a crown jewel to them to sort of uh, have this, you know, sort of uh, rebooted and uh, be successful, but, mo but I think most importantly, honor the original series. Um, so I think, um, I think, you know, maybe part of me uh, was a little naive when I went into it, so. What's the, uh, I keep saying I have no more questions, or I'm <laughs> done with questions and I keep adding questions to it. What's the final goal for the show? Just to let it run as long as you can, potential movie, or just day to day? I think, Y5O movie. Maybe. No, I think for us, and, you know, as us as writers and, and building the show, for us it's day to day and you just want to make, you know, every episode, you know, as, as best as, you know, as good as it can be and I think, uh, I think you always, you know, you love, and people always say to us, like, you know, wish us good luck and say, well, hopefully we'll run the, you know, 12 years like the original. But I think you just think every episode needs to be great and every episode has to be uh, a reason why the network says, let's keep this on the air, so. Right, let's, uh, let's back up to some previous uh, work you did. Uh, 24, you know, 24 in CSI New York, a couple of things I wanted to, uh, to uh, bring up. Any, anything, any notes that, uh, any, anything? You want to share about those two shows? I know they really captured the public, had a rabid fan base similar to uh, Hawaii Five-0, especially 24. I mean, just to, you know, yeah, just, a, just an intense show for years. And that must have been just a, just a, a trip to work on that show, yeah, for lack that of was, a better word. Yeah, that was great. That was a great experience. And, and uh, I got to work with a, a, a couple close friends of mine. And uh, Joel Cerna, who created it, um, was my boss on, on uh, La Femme Nikita, so I got to work with him, and that was a good experience. Um, I also remember <clears throat> I, was in, uh, I was in Europe somewhere, and uh, somebody had heard that I, I, I wrote for 24, and they asked me for my autograph, and I thought, wow, like, either they're thinking I acted on the show, or <laughs> they're just really hardcore fans, and I realized that it has such a following that, uh, you, you know, just being associated with the show, you're sort of a celebrity because they had such hardcore fans, and uh, it was just a good experience, you know, all around. Uh, some questions from the uh, online audience, and if you guys have any questions, jump to the mic, let me know. Uh, back to Hawaii Five-0. Uh, actually, before I go to that, um, go ahead and give me your question here live. Yeah, um, my name is Jonathan Parker. Uh, I'm a big fan of your show. I I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is, uh, were there any issues with the uh, Leonard Freeman estate? And the second one is, as you talk about the island being a character, for me, uh, my memories of my youth, the, it was also uh, about the music, which the theme song is obviously you know, part of the game. It's probably the only TV show now that has a theme song. And in the old days, there were like variations on that theme during the show, and, and I, I don't think that it, it ex exists now, and I was just wondering if that was thought about or, or uh, how you handle that. Um, I think for me, you know, just um, Morton Stevens' uh, um, theme, I, I, I felt that was, you know, a, a big key to the success of that show. I mean, anywhere you go, you talk 5-0, people either gonna say book him down or they know that theme song, so I think, uh, honoring that was important to me. Um, but in terms of the music, I just feel like uh, uh, to contemporize it, to, to sort of, you know, sort of make it work for, for today, I, I feel like, uh, um, you know, I have this great composer and, and sort of, you know, we sort of, you know, we honor it in the titles, but sort of like have a, a style of its own. Um, just to, again, to 
make it feel a little fresher. Um, just to go back to your other, your other question, your first question, um, I, I don't know of any, you know, there were any situations with the Freeman estate. In fact, I thought it was fairly smooth in, in terms of, and again, remember, they were trying to develop this for years. Um, I can tell you this, I, I talked to Rose Freeman a lot, probably once every, probably once every two weeks. Um, she get, I send her scripts, uh, uh, so I stay very close, and, you know, and she is a big fan of the show, and, and uh, she always tells me that she wishes that Leonard, Leonard would, would be around for one day to see this franchise back up and running, and uh, just a great woman and a big supporter of the show, so I, I, um, I don't know of any sort of complications, but I think those were probably, if there were, they were probably smoothed out long before I came around. Questions from the online audience. Why are so many old TV shows?